Good evening, Life Story Church friends, family, uh, visitors from YouTube, Facebook, everybody, wherever you're coming from tonight. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, welcome back to our Wednesday evening online uh, streaming. Uh, we're, we've been studying through the book of Revelation in weeks past. We've had a couple weeks off. It's good to be back into the swing of things, though. So I hope you're ready to do some Bible studying tonight. Get your Bible out. Uh, get ready to flip those pages. We're going to be studying Revelation chapter 19. We're going to go uh, through the whole chapter, verse by verse, and see what the Lord has for us uh, this evening. Are you ready for that? I hope so. Uh, do me a favor, first things first, if you're tuning in, click like, click hi, comment in the comments below. Uh, if you see a, a, a friend of yours uh, tuning in as, as well, or somebody, even somebody you don't know, say hi, say that you're glad that they're here, give them that virtual hug that I like to talk about as far as uh, uh, the fact that we're not meeting in person, but we are meeting in this online forum. So give them that virtual hug. Say, hi, I'm glad you're here. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. All that good stuff. So uh, do the hi, the wave. And uh, every time you comment tonight, it helps drive the traffic up for this video. So we appreciate when you do that. So be talkative tonight. If I ask a question, answer the question. If you know the answer, if you have a question yourself, ask the question. Say hello to your friends, to your church family, all that good stuff. Share this video in the bottom left-hand corner of the video. If you're looking on an iPhone, I know that I've got an iPhone, so that's where that little share button is. So click share. We've got so many people in the church today that are here because they saw something on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or wherever, they discovered us online and that's how they joined our fellowship, uh, be it in person on Sunday mornings, many families in the church in person on Sunday mornings, but also joining live. I know right now we've got people tuning in from Florida. Hello, Florida, friends and family. We've got people tuning in from Arkansas. Hello, Arkansas, friends and family, South Dakota. We've got people from all over the globe tuning in. Uh, especially through the Calvary Harvest uh, group that we're a part of uh, as well. So that truly goes all over the world. Uh, over 70 countries, I believe, we're, we're streaming to now through those guys. So make sure that you guys do your part. Click share. Show the media team that you appreciate the hard work that they're doing. When we've got these awesome graphics that come out on the Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page, make sure that you click like, make sure that you click share. A lot of time and effort goes into that, guys. So uh, show them your love and uh, sharing that. So uh, if you haven't done that yet, now's the time right now. I'll give you a second. Okay, you shared, right? Yeah? I'm sure we got a bunch of shares just then. So we're going to continue into Revelation uh, chapter 19 tonight. And I've got a lot to get to, so I'm just going to go ahead and begin. I know I normally talk about LifeStoryChurch.com. Make sure you go there. You can partner with us online, all that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because I've got a lot I want to get to tonight right here. Just take advantage of all the online stuff, okay? We are, let me give you a, sno a synopsis of uh, this final section of where we are in the, the end, very end of the Bible. We've been studying Revelation for months now on Wednesday night, and boy, haven't we had some good, deep studies uh, taking this apart. Well, let me see this first graphic, if you would. As we went through chapter 17 and then uh, chapter 18, we looked at Mystery Babylon. We looked at uh, uh, the city of Babylon, which the 17 and 18 kind of go together. As we move forward, we're going to be looking at the millennium that is to come, the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth. Then we're going to look at eternity in 20, chapter 21, and then... And then a conclusion that the Holy Spirit gave John in chapter 22. Tonight, though, we are specifically focusing on chapter 19, the return of the king. You know, uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, third movie in the trilogy, the return of the king, wasn't, uh, wasn't the original, wasn't the original uh, uh, story that talked of a king returning, was it? Not at all. Christ the King will return to this earth and he will put right all that is so, so wrong in this world. All of the hurt, all of the brokenness that you feel, that you see, it will be put right one day. So as hopeless as it all feels and can seem sometimes, it is not hopeless. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And he's promised that he will return, and there is a promise that it will be put right. So uh, we see this reality declared, honestly, to us as early as the birth of Christ. This promise that even before, and we'll get to that, but as early as when the angel came to Mary. Remember when, when the angel came to Mary and let her know she was going to be having a virgin birth and everything else? Let's just take a look at that real quick. Before we jump into uh, chapter 19, Luke chapter 1, let me read to you verse 31 and 33. And I behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua. That's Jesus in the Greek, Yeshua or English, Yeshua. He will be great, verse 32, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, is David really his father? Obviously, we know David is not really his father, but in the lineage, it's telling us right there, he will be of the seed line of David. And he will be given that throne. Let's keep reading, verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, the house of Israel. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Amen. Do you believe that, church? Let me ask you a question. Do you take this scripture when you read it seriously? Do you take it seriously? The throne of David at the time of this prophecy, we have to understand, did not exist yet. It didn't exist yet. The Roman Empire was ruling at the time that the angel came and told Mary. There was no David on the throne. There was no lineage of David on any throne. No, Rome was ruling at the time. Since Rome moved in and conquered Jerusalem, you know, there hasn't been, there hasn't been a, a, a throne of David since. So has this promise been fulfilled, we have to ask? No. Will it be fulfilled in the future then, is the next logical question. Well, what does that really mean? What does this all really mean? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. We've got a promise here, church. We've got a promise from God, our father here. Let's take a look at this next graphic. What is the promise? What is the, what is the promise? The Davidic covenant. The throne will be established forever. God promised David a royal dynasty. Come on now. A royal dynasty. An eternal throne. You see on the graphic all of the different references uh, to the claims I'm making here. So look these scriptures up. We don't have time tonight uh, to go through all of them. But these are promises. And here are the references of where the promises are made. God's promise, Davidic covenant, a political kingdom, Genesis 17. It was even confirmed by oath in different psalms. This cannot be applied to the church, okay? I know a lot of people want to twist the scripture and they want to do replacement theology. Ezekiel 37 clears that up. It was, a, it was this future throne, this future throne that was recognized by the first church council as early as Acts chapter 15. And they were quoting in Acts chapter 15, Amos chapter 9 and Jeremiah chapter 30. Church, he is coming to reign. Somebody say amen. Woo! I can feel it tonight. He is coming to reign on this earth. Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, come, come now, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. He is coming to reign and he is coming to set right all of the atrocities that Satan and those who embrace wickedness, hear me now, have subjected to this world. He will set... Hear me now, he will set right all of those atrocities and all the wickedness that has been perpetrated by those who do so. And if you are of the ilk that do so, hear the Holy Spirit in my voice now as a warning. Jude chapter 1 verse 14 through 15 reads as such, Now Enoch, you guys know this, come on life story people, put your hands together. 
Somebody give a high five, or I don't know what those emojis are, because we just finished Jared a few weeks ago. Now, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with what? Ten thousands of his saints. But that word isn't just uh, saints, it's really myriad, okay? It's it's angels, it is uh, uh, saints, it is the church, it is angels, all of them. To execute what? Judgments on all. That's not very popular to talk about these days, is it? Judgment upon the earth? No, nobody wants to think about anybody having to pay for anything, right? Or pay for any um, anything at all. Execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. He loves that word there, doesn't he? And of all the harsh things which ungodly, there it is again, sinners have spoken against them. Why am I going to this scripture right here, right now? This is the oldest prophecy uttered by, hear me, you prophecy students, this is the oldest prophecy uttered by a prophet. This is a prophecy that predates the flood of Noah. Did you know this is a prophecy of Enoch? And guess what? It is of the second coming of Christ in the end times, at the end of the tribulation period. So, my goodness, I think we're in the right place tonight. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, let's begin. After these things, we've heard that phrase before, haven't we? In uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, metatauta is the word in the greek it is uh in revelation chapter 4 verse 1 it's in revelation chapter 7 verse 1 it's in revelation chapter 18 verse 1 and now here it is again for the fourth time in revelation chapter 19 verse 1 it means after the church things in uh chapter 4 after the things that we just studied about in previous weeks there it is after these things i heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying what Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Alleluia is the Greek form of the Hebrew word hallelujah. Hallelujah. Four different times, okay? Uh, the only occurrences in the New Testament are here that it's used in Revelation. What does it mean? It means praise Yahweh. Uh, the Tetragrammaton, if you would. They praise Yahweh, the name of the Father. It occurs 24 different times in Psalms, but only four times do we see it in the New Testament, and they're all right here in Revelation, okay? Uh, 24 times, I should say, rather, in Psalms, just 146 through 150. It's first use, first use, okay? was to celebrate the Ark of God in the midst of Zion. And it was sung for three different reasons. Can I see those reasons? We've got three different reasons. Alleluia is sung. And we're about to see them as we read forward into uh, chapter 19. Number one reason, God has judged his enemies. Say it with me. Alleluia. Say it in your living room. Number two reason, God is reigning. Somebody say it with me. Alleluia. And thirdly, the bride is ready. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's read Revelation chapter 2 through 9. Let's read it. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And that goes back to chapters 17 and 18. We've just been through all of that, so revisit that on YouTube if you need to. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Verse 3, again they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, now this is interesting because this is the last, pay attention here, this is the last reference to the 24 elders that we first caught up with back in chapter 5. The 24 elders. From here on... I think that they are simply referred to as the bride, okay? This is the last time you'll hear the elders referred to. So 
and the 24 elders and the four living creatures, the four living uh, creatures, fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne, saying again, Amen, Alleluia. So there's the first point. God has judged his enemies. Okay? First reason to say Hallelujah. Verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. Verse 6. And I heard... Uh, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying again, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, omnipotent, uh, uh, um, omnipotent reigns. So God is reigning. There we have it. Hallelujah, God is reigning. Amen. Verse 7. Let us be glad. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Who's his wife? Hmm. His uh, bride-to-be. Verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Underline that. That's significant. What is the fine linen? It is the righteous acts of the saints. And lastly, verse 9. Then he said to me, Write Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The bride, the bride is ready, church. So third reason to say Alleluia, the bride is ready. Who is the bride, though? There's been a lot of conjecture over the years a lot of great scholars come down on different sides of this issue. Um, let's take a look at this graphic. Is the bride Israel? A lot of people think the bride may be Israel. Like I said, good scholars that I don't want to, wouldn't say anything bad about, but I might have a difference of opinion on is academic issues. And uh, honestly, I think that probably the larger portion of... Um, the pastoral world uh, doesn't take the words so literal anymore and thinks maybe that this bride here is literal, uh, or is Israel, rather. Is the bride Israel? Well, Israel throughout the scripture, as we can see, is referred to as many different things. The wife of Yahweh, Isaiah 54. But she's also referred to as a harlot in Ezekiel chapter 16. As we read Hosea chapter 2, especially verses 14 through 23, we learn some object lessons about Israel. Uh, the wife from whoredoms as a type of Israel, gifts to lovers to prevent want. Bought at a slave market, Hosea was to love her anyway, remember? Even though she was a harlot, not pure, and everything that we just heard, uh, uh, Revelation say about this bride. She was also portrayed as widowed uh, widowed in Revelation chapter 18. There's a typo. Widowed in Revelation chapter 18, verse 7. So, divorced in Isaiah 54, Jeremiah chapter 3, Hosea chapter 2, divorced and widowed, Lamentations chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 54. So Israel is the harlot wife of, the, of God, the father. She was divorced, not, not for good, but temporarily widowed. Uh, in Revelation chapter 18, the harlot boasts... Uh, uh, sland slanderously boasting uh, to the Lord that she is no uh, widow. Um, she has not been divorced, all of that. Eight, Revelation 18, verse 7. So we see what we're seeing here. Is it, can we go back to that graphic real quick? A clash of idioms. A clash of idioms. Because an Old Testament priest cannot marry a divorced woman. And yet, Jesus is the, our high priest who fulfilled all of the Old Testament law. Okay, so is Israel divorced and widowed the bride-to-be here in Revelation? Well, interestingly, 
enough when we talk about the Hebrew tradition of marital preparation. Uh, there was a betrothal process, and we've taught about it many times. Ron does an awesome teaching on this. Um, we should have him back to do that uh, one of these times soon. But uh, we know that the process of being betrothed in the Hebrew culture, especially in a Galilean wedding ceremony, you know, uh, the, the groom-to-be, he'd fall in love with a young girl, he'd desire the girl, he'd talk to his dad, his dad would talk to her dad, they'd figure out bridal price, all of that stuff, they'd be behind-the-scenes uh, deal-making to make this happen for the two young lovebirds. The son would take the family cup off the mantle, go with his father to the bride's home and present it. Present her if she would drink from the cup. If she took the cup, it was an acceptance of the betrothal and the proposition for marriage. If she rejected it and it was her right to say no, she had free will and free choice, then he would turn and he'd say, Father, take this cup from me. And it's all very, uh, very type and shadow of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, take this cup from me. Because the Jewish people rejected him. Uh, his bride had rejected him when he came the first time. Really beautiful. But, you know, during this betrothal process, there was a period of time that the groom would go and prepare the living accommodations for his bride in his father's house. If he went and she accepted, said yes, everything was a celebration. He'd go back to his father. He wouldn't just take his bride back. It wasn't on the spot. He'd go back to his father's house and he'd start building a house onto his father's house. And his father... His father would have the final say of when everything was ready, when it was good enough, when it was built to his specs. So only the father knew when it was time and it was ready. And that's also where we get other scriptures, like when Jesus said, you know, he was making an idiom to that, uh, reference to that, when he said, uh, you know, uh, only the father knows when it's time to come in that scripture. In any case, uh, the groom at that point would come for his bride when the ha when the room was ready uh the time was not known exactly to her she lived in expectation until he surprises her upon his return she is to keep her oil in her lantern so she is not unprepared when he comes because oftentimes they would come at midnight blowing shofars clanging instruments and it was a big to do um, and it'd be in the middle of the night, so she had to have oil in her lamp ready to go. So it's a surprise gathering. He would, uh, he then would return with her to uh, the groom's father's house for the hoopah, a wedding ceremony to consummate the marriage and to celebrate the wedding feast for the next seven days, okay? Uh, during which the bride remained... Uh, uh, closeted essentially in her bridal chamber so we see here don't we uh certainly a pattern for a tree tribulation rapture here if we're looking at a seven-year tribulation period uh, we return to our father's house for a feast for a marriage supper and remain in our bridal chamber for seven days or seven years seven days is seven years prophetically in the scripture uh, John chapter 14, verse 2, to back that up, tells us, In my Father's house, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So it's within this context that Jesus speaks here. So let's just take a, let's just take a, wide angle 10,000 foot view of what we're looking at here the marriage supper of the lamb revelation chapter 19 can we see the marriage fulfilled let's just take a, a, a 10,000 foot view of this covenant established okay read more about that in 1st Corinthians 11 25 in regards to Jesus and us the purchase price was agreed upon by the fathers okay 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, what was the purchase price? Of course, it was the blood of the lamb. The bride is to be set apart. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 6, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 13. Reminded of this covenant by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom left for the father's house. Why? He prepares 
the room addition. The bride, in the meantime, prepares for his imminent return. And we say imminent because she doesn't know exactly when it's going to happen. It could happen any time. Then, all of a sudden, there is a surprise gathering. When there is this surprise gathering, what happens? They go to the Hoopa tent where they stay for seven days for the wedding ceremony. A seven-day marriage supper happens. See that reference in Judges 14, Matthew 9, Matthew 22, and then John chapter 2. Speaking of that, let's read Luke 22, verse 15 through 18. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Mm. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. It's, it's really cool, guys. When you look through the word of God and you see marriage again and again and again, over and over again, used as a way to communicate intimacy between God and us, between God and the and us who he loves. Marriage is always used as a type and shadow over and over again in the Bible. It communicates intimacy and moreover our intimacy with him, church. Why? Because simply put, here, take a look at this next graphic. Put this up on the screen for me, okay? We are the bride. We are the bride. Look these verses up for me. Matthew chapter 9, 15. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 through 32. We are the bride. And guess what, guys? We have got a banquet to attend. Somebody say amen. Come on now. Get excited for me. We've got a banquet to attend. And guess what else? We just read it. Jesus is looking forward to it. He held the, the cup of redemption in his hand, the third cup of the Seder. Mm. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until, until we're there. So, too cool, isn't it? I think so. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse 10. Verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. John being showed these things by an angel. Keep in mind where we're at. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I love this. In the Greek, that phrase is hora me. Hora me. Two staccato words. Hora me. <laughs> Almost sounds Italian, no, huh? Hora means to see with the mind, to perceive, to know, uh, or not, right? So uh, another way to say this uh, in the Greek, and I'm not—I don't speak fluent um, uh, Greek here, but stare at me not, in other words, or even you know better. You know better. This angel was not about to be ensnared as Lucifer was in Isaiah chapter 14. Worshiping angels was wrong. And if you want to read more about that, you can go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Okay, And John knew this. And the angel essentially saying to John, because they observe us, Angels observe us. The word of God tells us that they observe us and they're kind of just in awe of us in the special place that we have in God's heart. So uh, the angels looking at John saying, you know better. You stare at me not. Stare at me not. You know better. Okay. Uh, worshiping angels was wrong. He knew this. The angel was not only a servant of God, as we learn in Hebrews 1, but... Uh, but Acts chapter 10 tells us all about not worshiping servants. John was just, he was just overwhelmed here in this moment. Overwhelmed. 
And he even repeats this later, we'll come to find out, in Revelation chapter 2. So he, knowing better, he was just like overwhelmed, wanted to worship and started worshiping the angel. And the angel is like, you know better. Stare at me not. You know better. Don't do that. I'm not going to fall for that. I don't want, ugh, right? Can you imagine for all the angels in heaven how... How much they don't want to be worshipped. They don't even want to be uh, associated with anything that caused Satan to fall. So anyway, here's where we get to Christ on a white horse. Verse 11. Here we go. I hope you're ready. Now I saw heaven opened. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being John here? Heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So heaven opened, just like at Jesus' baptism. Okay, it's the only other time we see this. Heaven opens up. His enemies now know he is coming. Think of Revelation chapter 12, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 26. His enemies know he is coming. And guess what? He is under oath to come in such a manner. My goodness, this is distinct from the, the horsemen of Revelation chapter 6. Because here he is not coming in the air to take his people. No, not like in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But he is coming, he is coming to the earth with his people. Ooh, that is a cool visual. And he's coming to conquer his enemies enemies and he's coming to establish his kingdom church he's coming to establish his kingdom faithful and true church come on now this is an appointment that was made a long time ago we're reading about it right here in revelation chapter 19 verse 11 but this appointment that jesus is now we're reading about him making at some future date and make no mistake, he will make that appointment. He won't miss it. He won't be 15 minutes late. He'll be right on time. He won't even be early. He'll be right on time. It was an appointment that was made a long time ago. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 14 has the prophecy. The Lord will enter into judgment. That's what we're talking about here. Let's read it. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people. Hmm and his princes with them. So again, difference here of the church coming with Jesus versus being here and meeting him in the air, right? With the elders of his people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is, on, is in your houses. Ooh, what a condemnation. It was revealed, it was revealed that the white rider on the horse, by the way, would be Jesus. It was revealed uh, to us in Jesus' reading at the synagogue of Nazareth. you remember that? Remember when Jesus, uh, in Luke chapter 4, went into Nazareth? He began his ministry on this day. The day he began his ministry was on the Day of Atonement. He went into the synagogue in Nazareth. He unrolled the Isaiah scroll and he began to read and he stopped at a certain point intentionally, stopping early before the end of the sentence. I know some of you scholars know what I'm talking about. Let's just read it real quick. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and, to, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That word acceptable there, hold that screen, means dektos in the Greek. It means mercy, the year of mercy and free flowing favor that abounds. Bounds. That's what that word means in the Greek, dektos. Come on now. That's what he came to do, is to declare that that time, that period of history had begun. 
Verse 20, then you know what he did? Then he closed the book after saying such a powerful thing, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He stopped at this comma, though, church, and said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, and the place went nuts. First of all, I mean, I'm sure they loved their protocols, right? Oh, you can't stop without um, finishing out the scripture. Finish the scripture. That's not why they went nuts. He declared that the Dectos year of the Lord had begun, and today it is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, saying the Messiah has come. The place went nuts and they tried to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> Honestly, read the whole passage. They tried to, before it was all over, they tried to throw him off a cliff, but he slipped away. What a way to start a changing of the guard, huh? What a way to, what a way to start the transition as all of history pivoted and would never be the same. The world would never be the same after that moment. What a way to do it. But what came after the comma? is what I'm trying to get at tonight. He was reading from Isaiah, remember? So let's go to the actual Isaiah scroll to read what he didn't read, because Luke only records what he actually read. Let's go to the Isaiah scroll and read all of it. Uh, Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Sounds familiar, right? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, liberty to the captives, and the opening of prisons to those who are bound. Verse 2. To proclaim, there it is, the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stopped right there. Why? Because what comes next is and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. The time of vengeance had not yet come, but it will come. It will come. And it will come at the hands of Jesus himself when he rides in Revelation chapter 19 on that white horse. Revelation chapter 12 verse, uh, Revelation chapter 19 verse 12 continues. Let's read his eyes, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, diadems. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is interesting because as we've studied through Revelation, we talked about his first stop is in Petra, and then before he makes his way all the way up into the Galilee to uh, Armageddon, right? And on that journey, it's the exact number of furlongs that is prophesied. Uh, you can't make that stuff up, right? Um, and his cloak, the horse, blood runs to the horse's bridle. You know, his cloak is, as one treads the wine press, you know, you get gra grape juice on the foot of your robe, right? He gets blood on the foot of his robe, as the analogy is made. Um, so we see more of that here with he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and on his, and his name is called the word of God. Note the emphasis on his names here, okay, through uh, verses 11 through 13 and then here in 16. This is a secret name. No one knows, no one knows it, right? So uh, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. This is interesting. I wonder what it is, don't you? Uh, let me see this next graphic, because throughout the Gospels, we know that Matthew referred to him often as the King of Kings. Mark called him faithful and true. John referred to Jesus as the Word of God. He is the Word, and Luke called him the Son of Man. Hmm. Let's keep going. Verse 14. Verse 14. And the armies in heaven, the armies in heaven, Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. He leaves heaven to come to the earth for the last battle, church. The last battle. Armies. What are these armies? Well, we can look at Jude chapter 14, or, or verse 14, Zechariah chapter 14, 
angels are with him, according to Matthew 13 and 25, 2 Th Thessalonians chapter 1. But we are also with him, church, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 2, Colossians chapter 3, and Zechariah chapter 14. If you want my notes, I'll send them to you. But we are with him, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What In this dirty world right now, doesn't that thought just feel so appealing? Followed him on white horses. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. A sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. On that throne of David at that he himself treads the winepress and we mentioned that a second ago of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god i don't think that people truly understand what the wrath of god is truly going to look like here on this earth against the wicked when it comes to pass i don't think even those of us who truly love what is good, love what is pure and holy, and therefore are sick and disgusted, heartbroken, and even hate things like child trafficking and the abuse and the true evil and wickedness that is rampant in this world. Even we who are aware of all of that and truly believe that there must be justice, right? Not that we take joy in the thought of anybody receiving punishment at the hands of God, but we understand at least that there must be justice for the, the abuse of innocence and the abuse of um, children. Uh, even we, who are somewhat prepared for wick the wicked and unbelieving world to receive judgment, even I don't think that even we understand the wrath, what the true wrath of God is going to look like on this earth at that point. I mean, we, you know, uh, we know that at some point Satan will be drugged before all of us and we'll look on him and we'll pity him and we'll say, is this, this is the guy, this pitiful thing is the one that caused so much trouble, right? That day will come, but, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that, but it's also, I think, hard for us to imagine what the fierceness of his wrath is and how fierce. I don't think we can truly imagine how fierce it's really going to be. He himself treads the wine press of the fierceness, it says, and wrath of the Almighty. The sword and the rod of iron, though. The sword and the rod of iron. Let me take a look. Let's take a look at this graphic. Can we? Um, the sword. We see that referenced many times. We know uh, the sword of the spirit, so on and so forth, from Ephesians chapter six, famously. But we see that reference in Isaiah 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 4, Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 19, chapter 21, also Psalm 149, Isaiah 49. I mean the sword, the sword, the sword, the sword of God. We see it over and over again. Enemies are consumed with the spirit of his mouth. Amen. That means he just speaks and they are laid to waste. Somebody say amen. And then the rod of iron that's referenced here, we see that reference throughout Scripture all over the place as well. Psalm 2, Revelation 2, Revelation 12. And then here again, it's about authority, church. Holding the rod of iron is about he who has authority over everything, guys. There is no rapture here, okay? Let's be clear. Don't get confused with what's happening here. We have to understand. If you, you, can, if you study Revelation, you study end time prophecy, you can get confused real quick if you don't understand that there are different occurrences about Christ's coming, okay? When Jesus comes to get the church, he comes to the air. He doesn't set a foot down on the earth, when he does, when the second coming of Christ that everybody talks about, don't confuse that with the rapture of the church, or you'll get a lot of different scriptures mixed up and confused. And then, in being confused, you're more vulnerable to falling prey to bad teaching. Okay, um, uh, bad teaching that's done either innocently or bad teaching that is done diabolically, and there's plenty of both. Okay, so know that Jesus came the first time. 
the next time he comes, he's not coming to earth, he's coming to the clouds and he'll call us to be with him. And the third time, the second coming of Christ is not the rapture. It's truly at the end of the tribulation period when he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives. It's split in two. There's a fault line they discovered in recent years right down that mountain, which is a confirmation of scripture. But there is no rapture here, okay? But the revelation, let's go back to the graphic, okay? Not in the air. Jesus does not come in the air here. He is coming to the earth and he's not coming for the saints, but he is coming with the saints. And he's not coming to comfort, but to conquer. Somebody say amen. Not to protect us in heaven, but he is coming to rule with us on earth. I almost sang that a little bit. With a rod of iron to rule, church. That's what this is all about. Verse 16. Verse 16. We're getting there. We're almost done. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. This is so cool. King of kings and Lord of lords. All kinds of cool uh, ref scriptural references to him being the king of kings and Lord of lords. Genesis chapter 24, uh, Genesis chapter 47, Daniel chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 10, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Let's keep going. Or we'll be here all night. Let's keep going. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he carried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of the king of kings. Whoa. That's quite a visual, huh? Calling, calling to the birds in the air. Come on, hey, I got a meal for you. Eat the flesh of the kings. The flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. One thing we need to understand in Revelation, church, especially in chapter 19, there are two suppers, okay? One of them you don't want to be at, okay? One of them you do want to be at. Two suppers. Let's not get them confused here, okay? This, this uh, fl word flesh occurs six different times in this paragraph, okay? The birds are eating the flesh of these kings that thought they would challenge God. Verse 19 reads, and I saw the beast. Remember the beast, the beast of uh, chapter 13. The kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is so, it's kind of bizarre to wrap your mind around, isn't it? I mean, think about this for a second. They know who they're fighting here at this point. I mean, this is Yahweh. This is God, the creator God at this point. Who has, what's he done at this point? All the seals are broken. Trumpets are blown. Bowls of wrath poured out. Mystery Babylon, the city of Babylon destroyed. Jesus comes riding on the white horse. And their response is, is not to cower in fear. No, their arrogance is on full display. It is so bizarre to wrap your mind around. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you argue with people and you're like, I just don't understand how you think. I think this is a similar situation here that people think their minds are reprobate. Obviously, they have completely, there is no wisdom within them. How do you make war against God? right? The battle, let's take a look at this graphic to make this point. The battle, I love, I love it put this way, the battle is the laughter of God against man's arrogance, Chuck Missler says. The battle is the laughter of, of God against man's arrogance. Headquartered in Palestine, Daniel chapter 11, the coming world leader will go forth in great fury, a great motorized army arrayed in red, interesting, will swing into the area prerequisite to the second coming, a petition by the remnant taking refuge in the east. 
the most interesting thing about this to me is that there is not the slightest mention of any struggle. So they, they're trying to make war against God, but it's no war. There is, it's not even a competition. It's not even a competition. You know, I don't know if you're a basketball fan, but it was kind of like watching the Celtics and the Nets play last night. I mean, it wasn't even close, right? So uh, I say that as a Celtics fan. Psalm chapter 2 records a conversation uh, among the Trinity. I think that is just perfect for, for the context here. The Trinity itself is laughing at the arrogance of the kings of the earth who are taking up arms against God. Let's read it, shall we? Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> Too good. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. How cool is that? So cool, because Jesus will sit on his holy, holy hill on the throne of David. Let's wrap this up. Let's continue with uh, verse 20 and then 21. Then the beast was captured. There it is, guys. There it is. Whoo! Feel a load off, don't you? The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive. Huh into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and guess what when we come back to it when we revisit they're still there a thousand years later once when we get into revelation chapter 20 you're going to see a thousand years later they're still there two or the two are cast alive uh, into gehenna okay think of that versus the, the two uh prophets that come uh, probably Moses and Elijah. They're taken alive to heaven. The two, the false prophet and the Antichrist thrown mm, to Gehenna, to the lake of burning fire. And verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on his horse. The truth is a sword. And it comes out of your mouth, church. And it lays waste to more demonic activity than you could ever possibly realize. Mm. It's no wonder, uh, no wonder maybe they want to put a, a muzzle on you these days, huh? And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Whoa. All these birds have full tummies with the flesh of the kings. And there is no resurrection here. The rapture has already occurred all the way back in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, I believe. The second resurrection occurs a thousand years later, okay? Uh, unbelievers, when they die, when in closing here, when they die, they go to Hades, which is simply the unseen world, the temporary realm of the dead believers, though. When they pass, they go immediately into the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Paul, for that communication in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. So if you've ever wondered that, where is my loved one? I know he loved Jesus. Is he just sleeping in the dirt? What's going on? Believers go immediately into the presence of the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, okay? Hades will be emptied of its dead next Wednesday <laughs> when we read about it at some future point. But next Wednesday, we're going to read about, read about it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 13. The depths give up their dead. Maybe that's what I'll name the sermon because that's what it's all about, guys. So with that, we'll close because Jesus at this point, come on now, Jesus right now, Revelation chapter 19 
takes the throne upon the earth. Amen. Amen. He, Jesus takes the throne, the throne of David, and here he is. I can't wait to see what happens next. I love you guys so much. Thanks for tuning in and learning the Bible with me tonight. It's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? I know we went through a lot and we went through it quickly, so watch it again, and I hope you're taking notes and all that good stuff. And if you need any help, uh, reach out to me, okay? We love you guys. We'll see you Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to continue our study in Ephesians. This coming week will be in Ephesians chapter 2, so if you want to cheat and get ahead of the game, you can read uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be studying that Sunday morning. We're going uh, through Ephesians chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, it's already blessed us so much. It's going to continue to do so. So Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. at the Rutledge West in Pegram, Tennessee, off the Macquarie Lane exit on the west side of Nashville, and uh, online at... Facebook Live and on YouTube.com. So we love you guys and we hope to see you then. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he pour his favor out on your lives. May you go in grace and prosper in all you do in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a good night.